Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you. We're going to start our sermon today. It's going to be Mark chapter 14, verse 66. I'm sure most of you have a Bible now. If you'd like to find a Bible near you and turn to it and go through it with me. I call it that first paragraph. It's uh, paragraph 77, and it's uh, verse 66 to 72, and Je Peter denies Jesus. So, and Peter was beneath in the palace, and there cometh one of the maids of the high priest, and when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked upon him and said, And thou wast also with Jesus of Nazareth. Do you know what? I was made my job one day, a long time ago. In fact, this has occurred quite a number of times in my life. For example, one day I was in, I was in Starbridge College, and I was meeting a person that gave special help to people with their reading and writing. See, sometimes people go to college and they need that bit of extra help. And she came to me, she's a rather tall, dark-haired, quite a, a, a nice, beautiful lady. And she came to me and she said, I, nice to meet you, Stephen. I'm the person that gives people extra help. And she said, and I'm a born-again Christian. And I said, oh, you're the religious one. And she said, yes, I am. I said, so am I. <laughs> but you know what, you know, sometimes in your job or in your home or in your life or in your neighborhood, You'll meet people and they'll say, and you're a Christian, aren't you? And that's the moment of truth, isn't it? Do you say, yeah, I am actually, yes. Or do you fear for your life? Of course, in those days, in the time when Peter was in the courtyard, he was fearing for his life. He just escaped a mob with swords and with clubs. Jesus had arranged that. He said, if you want me, let these go. And so they let them go. But the important thing is this, is that Peter knew that he could suffer for Christ and he knew that it would mean the end of his life. Wow. I think Peter had this premonition, as all the apostles did, and they all died martyrs. Apart from John, he had a living martyrdom because he was banished for his faith. But um, they all had this idea that they might have to seal their testimony with their own blood. And what we mean by blood there, we don't mean the actual red stuff. When we use the word blood like this, we just mean their own death. Okay? Some of them died without shedding a drop of blood, but they died, that's the point. So what was Peter going to do? This young girl, she was just a little slip of a girl. And she was there and she pointed a little finger at Peter and she said, and, and you were with Jesus of Nazareth. You can hear a little of a squeaky voice, can't you? Uh, but he denied it and said, I know not, and neither understand I what thou sayest. And he went into the porch. He slipped away into the porch. Out of the main open air place, he went into the porch to sort of escape a little bit. Didn't want to talk about this. And when he went into the porch, the cock crew. I don't think he was actually looking for that. He just happened to notice that happened. But it hadn't quite clicked in his head. What did Jesus have said already? He said, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. Do you know, sometimes as Christians, we have a poor memory in the wrong way. And we forget what it is to own up for Christ. And then the maid saw him again. Verse 69. And she began to say to those that stood by, this is one of them. And he denied it again. He wasn't betraying the Lord, as some people think. He was just denying that he knew him. And a little later, they that stood by said again to Peter, surely thou art one of them, because thou art a Galilean, and your speech agreeeth thereto. You see, Peter was a Galilean. He came from up the north. And they had a particular twang. You know, like, I remember a dear lady, dear old Jean. I love her. She's been here to the church for the first couple of years of her life. I told her this. For the first couple of years of knowing her, I couldn't understand a word she said. She was a Geordie. That explains it, doesn't it? I, I couldn't understand it. To be ages to attune my ears to the Geordie accent. Now I understand I'm perfectly normal. I just, I've just got that language now. Um, they said, your speech agrees. You have the twang. You have the Galilean voice. 
you see? And what did he do then? Did he say, oh, all right, then you've got me. I am a Galilean, yet I am, and, and I, I'm one of the disciples, and I'm one of his favoured few. Did he say that? No, he didn't say that. It says he began to curse and to swear and say, I know not of this, I know not this man of who you speak. Wow. Reminds me of Max Boyce. Am I allowed to have a joke here? Max Boyce, you know, he went up to the Astedford and he got up to do the poem, The Little Rabbit. And he started it off and after the line he forgot all the words. And his mother was on the front row and said, Someone said, is that your son? She said, I've never seen the boy in my life. <laughs> but that was funny, but this isn't funny. He says, I know not the man of whom you speak. Right? And what happened next? It says, and the second time the <coughs> cock crew. The second time the cock crew. Do you know, Attila, we think of you in your job. We think of all of you in your positions, in your colleges, the way you live. Because you know what? I've been a carpenter. I've had to work on building sites. And I've had to learn to be proud of Christ there. I've had to learn to be a Christian when I go on a Monday morning, when I go to work. That's what we've got to learn to do. But Peter at this time, he chickened out and he said, I don't know who you're talking about. And the cock crew. So the prophecy of the Lord Jesus was correct. By the way, Jesus wasn't making him do it. Jesus just told beforehand what he would do very accurately. And then in verse 72 at the end it says, And Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. And when he thought thereon, he wept. I think Peter, you know, he skulked off into the darkness, maybe outside of the porch, and he just got away with himself, and he thought, how have I possibly let Christ down like this? I told him a few, just a few hours ago that I would be prepared to die for him, and now here I am. I've denied in front of a little girl that I knew anything about him, and in front of the men that asked me about my accent. You see, this first test of Peter's faith, it was from a young girl. You're going to have tests of faith. This week I will predict to you that you will have tests of your faith. Not that you will deny the Lord, but your faith will be tested. Do you know why that is? Because you are a moral being. The whole of your life is about morality. You can't escape it. You are a creature before God. And you will be tested for your faith. And things will come into your life that you're probably quite familiar with because you've seen them before. And in fact, if you think about it, you could probably sit down and say, right, so on a Monday morning I go into that cafe and I have a cup of coffee. Oh yes, and there's a temptation there. I can pray about that before I go. And then I go down the road into a shop and there's temptations there too. And you know what? I know I'm going to do it in advance. And so I can pray that God will help me with that temptation, whatever it might be. And you might say, oh, and on a Tuesday, I always have a terrible temptation on a Tuesday because of such and such a person or such and such an event or such and such a circumstance. You can pray in advance, can't you? Of course, another way to avoid the temptation altogether it should just not be there. A bit like Joseph when he was in Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife wanted to have him. And so she said, come on, let's start, let's kiss and all that. And he said, no, I can't, I can't uh, abuse my authority in the house like that. This is, you're my master's wife. So she took hold of his cloak and what did he do? He left the cloak in her hand and slipped out of it and got out of the house as fast as he possibly could. He ran possible to run away so Peter withdrew from the light of the fire into the darkness of the porch and then from the porch he withdrew probably to the outside of the porch where it was pitch black they didn't have street lights in those days we were only talking about it just the other day about how dark the world is without any street lights at all you go out onto the moors on the night time 
you'll find out what dark really is. You know, when the cock crowed twice, Peter remembered what Jesus had said. But before the cock crowed twice, he would deny him three times. Peter went out and wept bitterly. What for? What did he weep for? I can ask you the question. In fact, as a friend of mine says, he says, I always ask my people in my church, what do they weep about? I could ask you, maybe I will. What is it that you weep about? Do you weep when someone loses the World Cup? No. Do you weep when your favourite person doesn't win it on Strictly? No, of course you don't. But you do weep, don't you? What are the times when you weep? What are the times when you weep, not for other people, but you weep about yourself? And you weep about the mistakes you've made. And you weep about your own unfaithfulness to God and to your family and friends. Do you weep like that? Let me say something. The test of your spiritual life is based upon this. Is what do you weep about? And do you ever weep for yourself? If you've never wept for yourself, then you've never known revival. You see, the very essence of revival is this, is that when God touches your heart and exposes you for who you are to yourself, then you'll weep. Has that ever happened? I remember many years ago, I'll give you an example of one of the first times, we were away in Tawin in, 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 in Wales, and we'd heard preaching and you know, the whole atmosphere was a revival atmosphere. And I can remember walking across the fields in the pitch black, off to the toilets. And halfway across the field suddenly hit me and I just knelt down and wept before God. Why? Because of the state of my heart that needed to be saved. That's why I ask you, what is it that you weep about? Now we're going to take a look at the next passage, which is chapter 15, verse 1 to 5. I call it Jesus before Pilate. And straightway in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council and bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. This is after they'd abused him and beaten him up. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And the answer <coughs> said unto them, you said it. The chief priests accused him of many things, but he stood there in his dignity, silent. Pilate asked him again, saying, Answerest thou nothing? How, behold, how many things they witness against thee? But Jesus answered nothing. And Pilate was amazed. It's not very often a man is amazed in Scripture. There's just a few examples. But Pilate was amazed, he was absolutely stunned that this clever, intelligent person who called himself, or other people called him the king of the Jews, would easily be able to defend himself in an open court against a lot of liars. Of course he would be able to do that. But he didn't do it, did he? And there comes a time in your life too when you may you may need to defend yourself and your reputation and you just don't have to. You don't have to do that. You haven't got to fight every battle and fight every corner. When people say things about you that are not nice, you haven't got to necessarily defend yourself. You can be there like the Lord Jesus and just say nothing. Just let, me, just let it pass. Not because you're weak, but because you're saying nothing is a, is a statement of your strength, not your weakness. So as soon as the day dawned, the religious leaders held a consultation with the full council. This was the whole of the Sanhedrin, a very auspicious group altogether. They were the religious leaders of the whole of the nation of Israel. Now it included the chief priests, it included the elders. Now the elders were the representatives of all the families of Israel. Sometimes they're referred to as the the elders, sometimes they refer into the heads, the heads of family. Up until just a hundred years ago, it was on the census, it would say 
you know, number 52, head Mr. Jones, because he was the head of the home, you see. So this is the people who were the representatives of all the heads of families in the whole nation. This, what was happening to the Lord Jesus, didn't occur in a little corner. Every single person of note in the whole nation was there and part of it. Some, be, some people have asked, where was Paul at this time? I suggest, may I suggest that because of circumstances, he was back home looking after his mother and father. Otherwise, he would have been very prominent. He was a very, very prominent person there. And it included all the scribes too. The scribes were those who made the copies of the Bible, copies of the Old Testament. They knew the scriptures exceptionally, exceptionally well. And they were the teachers of Israel. They were the people that taught in the temple all what God had said in the scriptures. And they all agreed, they all agreed to send Christ to Pilate. Now you could say, why is that? They sent Christ to Pilate because, you see, the Roman dominion in the land was so strong, it was a stranglehold upon the nation. Did you know, for example, that the high priest couldn't go about his high priestly work without Roman permission? So how, how did that work? Very simple. They took his coat off him and locked it in a cupboard. And you couldn't be the high priest and do your high priestly function without your official robes. Oh your garments of glory and beauty. So they kept a control on the high priest, and when you control the high priest, you control the rest. And they also said to all the judiciary, you cannot execute, we'll do the executions, thank you very much. And that stopped, that put, all the judiciary was put on hold, they couldn't do anything. And so they had to get Christ to pilot why? Because they wanted a crucifixion, that's why. And they, Jews never crucified, they stoned people. And why did they want a crucifixion? They wanted the cruelest and the hardest and the most painful death that they could ever think for a person they hated that much. Now let me just ask you something. If you need to have a measure of human wickedness, how deep can somebody steep how deep can they steep? People think of the Holocaust. They think of terrible things that happen. They think of multiple murders. Listen, this was the Holy One of Israel. And the religious leaders of Israel want him to be crucified by the cruel Romans. That was the level of their hatred of Christ. They didn't just want him dead. They wanted him crucified. You see, there's a scripture in the Old Testament which says... Cursed by God is everyone that ever is executed on a tree. Anyone that hangs on a tree is under the curse of God. They didn't just want Jesus put away. They wanted him to be cursed by his own father. And the only way they could do that was to have crucifixion. They led him away to Pilate. You know, handing over a Jew to the conquering Gentile power was an act of treachery in itself. Peter highlights all this. He highlights all this in his sermons in Acts chapter 2 and 3. And when Christ arrived at Pilate's house, he had all the wounds of the beating that he'd already had from the high priest. And the charges that were laid against him had suddenly changed. You see, up until this point, there were always religious charges. He calls himself God. See what I mean? They were all religious charges. But suddenly, all those religious charges have just evaporated like the morning mist. Now the charges are political because the person they're going to stand in front of is a political animal. And the charge now is treason. It wasn't blasphemy. You know, Pilate couldn't care less about blasphemy. But he, 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 he was concerned about treason. Definitely. Pilate was a seasoned politician. And so he cut to the chase and he asked Jesus outright. He said this. He said, are you the king of the Jews? Are you the king of the Jews? Now at this moment in time, Jesus also was under a moral challenge. If he said yes, then his moments were numbered. 
If he said, oh no, I'm just a religious leader, he'd have said, case dismissed, take him away. Nothing wrong with him at all. Jesus said this, in our words, it sounds a little bit odd in English, but in those days, he was saying, you have said the right thing. You said the right thing. I am the king of the Jews. When you turn to another gospel, he says, but my kingdom is not of this world, because if it was, all my soldiers would fight you, and I would never be delivered to you. He said, but my kingdom is of a world that is to come. So Pilate knew that this was not a political charge. He knew that he was not claiming to be a rival to Pilate or to Rome. He knew that, no question. And all the chief priests, they gathered around Pilate and they recited a long list of minor complaints against Jesus. And he answered him nothing. He answered nothing. Isn't that beautiful? If the Lord Jesus had gone into that trial and defended himself and won, he never would have died and you'd be lost in your sins for all eternity. That's the point, you see. He didn't do that. He didn't defend himself. The Lord Jesus allowed it all to happen to him. At one point he said, he said, do you not realise I can call down 12 legions of it? So how, many, how many soldiers are there in a legion? Anybody know? 5,000. So how many is in 12,000 legions? Go on, you're quick at maths, Mr. Treasurer. Okay. It's a lot, right? Okay, I'll, we'll just call it a lot. Listen, each angel had the power to kill thousands upon thousands upon thousands. When the Assyrians invaded Israel in Galilee in the time of uh, Hezekiah, an angel of the Lord went out against the whole host. It says they were so numerous they were like the sand of the sea. There literally was hundreds of thousands of people arrayed of the Syrians against Israel. They'd hired nations to help them to do it. And one, one angel went out and destroyed the whole. Destroyed them all. Every single one. And anybody that was nearby ran away. But 12 legions of angels Christ could have called for. And they would have rescued him without any doubt. But he wasn't there to be rescued. He was there to die for your sin. That's what he was there to die for. If he'd have been rescued, there'd be no preaching today, there'd be no churches today, there'd be no Christians today. You would be in your sins and you'd be lost for all eternity. That's why he died. Verse 9, And Pilate answered them, saying, Will you that I release unto you the king of the Jews? You see, there was a custom at the time of the Passover, and this was the day before the Passover, there was a custom in those days that he would, he would release somebody as a sort of a political gesture. It's very common. You know, when we have a new president of the United States, first thing he does is to issue a load of presidential pardons. It's a sort of a, it's something, the nice thing that he can do. Or well, at least that's what they think. And Pilate thought, well, I, I can do something nice for you. Would you like me to release to you the king of the Jews? And what did he say? He knew that for envy the chief priests had delivered him. Do you know, that's very insightful. Pilate was, he was an insightful man. He had a tremendous power. He also was a frightened man. But the most important thing is this, he understood people. And when they all presented themselves to him, he could look into each of their eyes and he could tell them what their motives are. And he says, do you know, I know that you were delivering Jesus to be crucified because you're jealous of him, right? You're jealous of him. So he says, would you like me to release to you the king of the Jews? But the chief priests moved the people. He stirred up a riot to the people that they should rather release unto him Barabbas to them. Now the word Barabbas, bar, the word Bar, means the son of. And what does Abba mean? Anybody? Sorry? The father. So this was the son of the father. He said, would you like me to release the son of the father to you? Or would you like to, me to release to you the one who really is the son of the father? Now then, what choice is it going to be? 
And this is a great challenge. Do you know, every single person you meet, man, woman, child, young person, every single person you meet is always in their life challenged by this one thing. Are you going to go with Barabbas? Are you going to go with Jesus? Are you, okay, are you going to go with Barabbas? Or are you going to go with Jesus? Who was Barabbas? Barabbas was a murderer. He was a, a traitor. He had made an uprising. He's what we would call today a terrorist. Are you going to go with the terrorist? Are you going to go with Jesus? Are you going to go the, with the one who kills people or are you going to go with the one that gives life? Because he raises Lazarus from the dead but Barabbas is killing people at the same time. So which one are you going to go for? Peter gets it right when he preaches. He says, he says you killed the prince of life and asked for a murderer to be given to you. Such is the injustice. It's unbelievable injustice. Can't, you can't even ex explain it. So they moved the people, and Pilate said to them, What then shall I do unto him that you call the king of the Jews? And that's the great challenge. I remember talking to a man quite recently, saying to him, just a very simple question, What will you do with Jesus of Nazareth? What will you do with him? Are you going to accept him? Are you going to love him because he loved you first? Are you going to receive the gift of salvation that he has died in order for you to have? Or are you going to say, no, no, I'd rather have the murderer. I think I'd rather have Barabbas. I think I'd probably rather have a terrorist. Someone that kills instead of someone that gives life. It's an ultimate question, isn't it? An ultimate question. You see, the chief priests had stirred up the crowd. They were political agitators. They were wicked, wicked, wicked men. And Pilate asked this famous question. It comes to every single man, woman, and child. It's this. What do you want me to do with the man that's called Jesus? What would you have answered if you were in the crowd there? May I suggest that every person in, in a way is there. You could have been the one of them people there. Now the question is, what would have been your answer? Verse 13, they cried out again, crucify him, crucify him. Then Pilate said unto them, why, what evil has he done? That's a great question, a great insightful question. What evil had he done to deserve execution and crucifixion in particular? What evil has he done? And was there an answer to that? No. There's no answer to that question. They cried out all the more exceedingly, crucify him. Was that an answer? They could have even put their fingers in their ears and said, crucify him, crucify him. We don't want to give an answer to the question of what evil has he done. We just want him dead. Such is the hatred that's rooted in a human heart. So Pilate, willing to contend the people, released Barabbas unto them, and he delivered Jesus to them. And when he had scourged him to be crucified. Scourging is a terrible thing. I won't go into the details here. It's pretty, pretty, pretty horrendous. Anyone that's seen the, what's that film, uh, whatever it's called, that depicts the Lord Jesus having been scourged. It is absolutely horrendous. Most people just died from that alone. But that was the preparation. That was the examination. That was the interrogation, the brutal interrogation of the Lord Jesus. Most men halfway through a scourging would blurt out the truth and get away. Most men would deny the, the charges. Most men would give in. The Lord Jesus, he didn't give in. He didn't say, stop, 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 I'll do whatever you say. Didn't do that either. And do you know what? <clears throat> Obviously the cross is one thing, but the scourging is something else. When the Lord Jesus was going through that scourging, he was probably thinking about me. Because all that he was going through in the scourging was for me. And every lash that he received, he received more than 40 stripes. But generally speaking, the scourge was only 
39 stripes because it was known that it could kill you doing that. But he did all of that for me. Oh, sorry, he did it for you as well, sorry. But he did it for me. That's the point. And I can never forget in my heart what he did for me. Amen.